Okay, so as you see, I have, I've, I've been involved in this project on 2D heterostructures for uh, six years. Uh, I guess we, we had a, a MURI, and then we have some follow-up projects going on. And along the way, uh, I've been lucky to um, uh, uh, collaborate with many people who've made many diverse contributions. Uh, and I, I'm not going to specifically say who did what as we go along. It's just because this lecture is somewhat unprepared. Uh, but anyway, these are uh, many, many of the people uh, uh, that have been the main contributors are, are here in the audience. So this is the, uh, uh, you know, the main group. Okay, so uh, okay, so I want to. Usually, I start off with like a 15-minute overview, but I don't think I need it for this audience. But the main thing I want to focus on is uh, is the geometry really of stacked uh, 2D heterostructures. So, uh, as uh, Paco mentioned, yes. There, so, in general, there is no periodic structure. So, what does that mean? Here's a, a five layers stacked. Uh, here we have uh, black phosphorus, aluminum disulfide, rotated graphene, hexagonal boron nitride. And if you look top down on this structure, the, you know, the characteristic of a, of a periodic material is you stand on an atom, any atom, you look around, you see uh, the same environment everywhere you go. And the characteristic of 2D heterostructures uh, and I use the word heterostructure to mean rotated uh, of the same sort. Um, uh, basically, every atom, if you, if, you, if you get dropped down there and you look around, they're in different positions. So that, uh, that leads to many uh, kind of theoretical and computational complications, because we can't just use the standard block, block theory tools. OK, so, uh, so we've. Uh, um, so we've kind of confronted this uh, problem in, in many different uh, uh, areas. Uh, so we've, we've, um, we've used the, our, this concept of configuration space, which I'll talk about, to study uh, mechanical properties. So Paul Cazot, after me, will uh, discuss, we'll discuss this. Uh, another project we've uh, been discussing is the problem of diffraction and dark field imaging for a uh, incommensurate heterostructure, because again, the standard, uh, pr the standard procedure is Fourier transform and inverse Fourier transform, and we don't have a true periodic structure. So what does diffraction mean in this context? Uh, I'll talk about uh, essentially density of states and, and Kubo uh, in the context of incommensurate heterostructures, uh, and then these are other kind of projects that have some relation to this. Um, OK. So, uh, OK, so part of what I, I want to do is, so people who've, who are on that long list, most of them know pretty much everything I want to say. But what I really want to do is communicate to uh, people who have not been familiar with our work and our approach, people coming from physics, et cetera. And, and one of the big. Uh, one of the big issues that has developed over time is, you know, I'm a mathematician, I come into this field, uh, we develop our own notation, which is very beautiful for us, and it's, but it's very confusing for physicists. So I, I've started to try to merge the notation. So, I, so part of what I want to do is, is kind of set this structure and notation. Uh, for a mathematician, having the right structure and notation lets us, you know, get much deeper into subjects. Um, so, you know, that's part, so I want to, so, so let me uh, spend a little time doing that. Um, okay, so, um, okay, so Brave lattice, as we know, what is this? So we, we look at a Brave lattice as just, we just map Z2 by a, a non-singular matrix A, and the columns of A are the lattice vectors. Uh, then we use gamma to denote uh, the unit cell. That's already confusing because we have gamma points. Uh, I don't know what, we're gonna, what we should do about that. Uh, and then, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're going to uh, very, very quickly move to tight binding models to, since we have large problems to, to discuss. And so we, we have a set of orbitals. Uh, 
say, normally just say some finite m set of norbit orbitals associated with each, with each unit cell. So those orbitals, uh, you know, those orbitals can correspond to basis functions centered at a lattice point, or they can be centered at other uh, uh, lattice points of the unit cell. So this lets us treat things like hexagonal structures, which are not lattices, right? But we still, it still fits into this general framework. And the general framework, you know, applies to any 2D material, uh, not just graphene, lignum disulfide. Uh, it's just a matter of having more and more uh, uh, kind of more and more orbitals. Our set alpha gets larger and larger to encompass these more complex uh, molecules. Okay, so then, uh, okay, so we use this notation of, uh, so we use, again, we're going to use script R for lattice points. We're going to use R for uh, uh, the points in the lattice. And then we use this uh, notation of script R star to denote the reciprocal lattice. Okay, and the reciprocal lattice vectors, we're going to use uh, the notation G, which is the common notation in physics. And, okay, I haven't, okay, so, Actually, I'm going to change this. I've changed this in the slide already. We just an analogy. We use gamma. You can. Use, we have used gamma star to denote the Brion zone, or a uh, some version of it. Uh, uh, okay, just following this notion of star being the the dual operation. But in fact, you'll see later on. I changed that to B Z along the way. So in case I haven't made this consistent. Okay, so now let me, let's just first uh, start with 2D bilayer geometry. So in that case, we have, we have two sheets. We have, you know, R, R, RJ1, RJ2. Now we have two, uh, in, two uh, invertible two by two matrices. We have two unit cells. Just everything is just indexed by J. <clears throat> Each sheet is individually periodic, but the, the combined system is generally not, not periodic, okay? And we're just gonna, we're gonna assume here that we're always in the non-periodic case, which is, okay. So then we can denote uh, our, uh, mul our multi-lattices by uh, omega one and omega two. These are just, omega one is just all the, what I call degrees of freedom, or for lattice one, omega two are all the degrees of freedom for, lat for lattice two, and then omega is the sum of all the degrees of freedom. I use the word degree of freedom to me. That kind of tells you, okay, which lattice points and which orbital. So all the, the matrices, all the Hamiltonians will be indexed by these, uh, th th these degrees of freedom. Okay, so now I'm gonna also, you know, we've been, the last, uh, certainly, year, you know, two, year or two, we've become very interested in uh, multi-layer uh, materials going beyond the bilayer case. Uh, so again, we're going to hear several talks on this. Uh, we'll hear again. Uh, Paul will talk about that uh, after after me. Then uh, Ku is going to talk about experimental work on trilayer systems, and Zoe will talk about electronic structure for trilayer systems. So uh, so let me uh, kind of uh, so I'm going to kind of. You know, I took, I've kind of taken my normal presentation and tr trying to expand it now to, to P layers. Um, so, okay, so now we just, in, we just index each of the lattices by J goes from one to P. We have, uh, we have unit cells, J goes from one to P. So everything is the same. Uh, so now we have a, a much larger set of degrees of freedom. Like, tip, like we've been most interested now in P equal two. But in fact, from uh, Paco's talk, there's, you can do P equal four and, uh, and some very complicated materials. Okay, so, uh, so, so I would say from our, our mathematical work, a fundamental contribution you know, is this notion that we call configuration space. And so pretty much everything from relaxation to electronic structure to conductivity uh, is gonna be formulated in the variables of configuration space rather than wave number. So pretty much the standard tool is block transform. So you're pretty much you're always do doing integrals over uh, the Brion zone, all right? Trace, you're integrating some trace of an operator over the Brion zone. That pretty much covers everything. Uh, now, again, we can't, uh, you know, we can't honestly do that in a, 
uh, incommensurate system. I mean, you could try to fake it, right, by straining one material, and so you're no longer in, in a ground state. When I first entered the field, that's the papers I found. People would, would, would strain one layer, get a small supercell, and hand it over to their band, band structure solver. So, uh, okay, so we, we uh, this, no, this notion of configuration space lets us approach incommensurate systems without approximation, okay, without straining a material or, or anything. So uh, now, in fact, uh, you know, we, um, uh, this, the, this notion of configuration space, I mean, okay, so let, let's look at a simple example here. <clears throat> okay, so this is just a twisted, you know, by, this is just a twisted, Two hexagonal structures, one twisted on another, at a small, at a relatively, at a at somewhat small angle. Okay, so uh, so what we see here is the uh, kind of famous Moray pattern. So a Moray pattern is also kind of described by by Paco. Is that uh, this is a uh, okay? It kind of looks periodic, but it's not. There's some, still some modulation in here, okay, if for, a, for an incommensurate system. Um, now, uh, so, let's, so, the, the, so the key thing here is, as, is we, let's say we, we, folk, we just look at the red uh, layer, and, and then we draw a, uh, a, a vector to the closest uh, to, to, to the one B, to, okay, but then we have like a, but we have a, like our unit cell for every red, for every red atom of the red layer, and then we go and write a vector to the, <coughs> to the blue atom in that unit cell, and as we wander through this, uh, this Brion zone, okay, we, we ha these vectors, <coughs> these uh, shift vectors, or from mechanics point of view, I would, we'd call them a disregistry. It's a disregistry. But <coughs> as we wander through uh, the set, wander through the, the Moray cell, these vectors uniformly sample. Uh, okay, so the the vec the, the, as we as we wander through the <coughs> through the atoms of the of the red layer, the vectors sample the. Uh, uh, sample the unit cell of the top layer. So that's what we we, we kind of see here. Uniformly sampled. Um, now this is simply <coughs> this is not a mysterious thing. This is simply a linear transformation, which I'll write down in a minute. It's a it's a simply a linear transformation. Um, so we say that because it's uniform, we say the configuration space is uniformly sampled. Now of course. Uh, what relaxation does is just give us some non-uniform sampling. But okay, here we're not, we're not looking at, un at relaxation yet. So we have a uniform sampling of uh, okay. So we have a uniform sampling of the disregistry as we wander through the uh, the unit cell. And uh, and like I said, we so we can describe the local environment um, uh, through this sh uh, disregistry. Or uh, local configuration, and and this approach has led us give a, to give a uniform and computationally efficient approach to mechanics, electronic structure, transport, diffraction, et cetera, et cetera. So again, so instead of traces, instead of integrating over a Brion zone, right? It's just a uh, you know we're just we're, we're just using a similarity transformation of our matrix of our Hamiltonian into a new set of uh, coordinates. The uh, uh, the configuration space. Okay. And okay, this is uh, okay. So now you know. Now you might ask, uh, what about tri-layer? Okay, before I go there, uh, that w you know, one thing that uh, uh, that's a little tricky here, and I think Paco kind of alluded to this. So and this kind of, I think it kind of confused us as we developed the subject. So. Um, so in fact, for generally, uh, you know, we can kind of, <coughs> this is just our super lattice. We can cover the domain with uh, a super lattice and, and, uh, and uh, super cells. Um, and, 
And like I said, the, the position of the atoms in, e in each is kind of slightly modulating, although it doesn't look that way. The continuum description is exactly periodic. Okay, the continuum description is periodic. The atomistic description is slightly modulated. Okay, so that's a little uh, kind of distinction here that uh, yeah, I, don't, I don't think we totally appreciated at first. Um, and okay, so, so you can use continuum models uh, to give us, and, we'll, we'll, uh, and I think Paul will probably allude to that when we do, say, relaxation. You can use a continuum model, uh, but then when you go and actually sample the atomistic positions, it's no longer periodic. So the con you sample, you can, you can, we're going to have a sampling of a, of a period continuous periodic function, but we're sampling from a, uh, a, non a non -peri you know, a, you know, we, we, again, underneath this continuum, um, with this pe with this periodicity, uh, underneath this function with this periodicity, we're we're going to be sampling a lattice, a twisted lattice that's it's that it itself is 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 a, is is, not, is incommensurate. Okay, so that'll okay. So now, uh, so that was a very pretty picture that Moray cell. Uh, let me also say that, and again. I, I look at all these things as a mathematician, so, uh, and I'm really always amazed by, wow, this is a, takes me a while to even understand what's going on, and now I'm starting to really appreciate that the, the, the importance of the Moray cell is the Moray cell, from the physics point of view, uh, my understanding, it acts like a gigantic unit cell, right? It acts like a gigantic unit cell. So you can talk about half filling, filling of Moray, you can talk about charge density in terms of a gigantic unit cell. I mean, that's, I think, why it's so, so key and so interesting. Um, uh, OK, so now, as I said, we've been focusing on tri-layer recently. And so then we could also just look at a, you know, here's a, uh, a tri-layer relaxation. And, and what, and what we see here, like we don't see a simple Moray pattern anymore. And again, I, Paul will describe it and Zoe more about this. And so this is what we call a, a Moray of Moray. So in other words, we have three layers, like layers one and two form a Moray, layer two and three form a Moray. But, they, uh, but then the, 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 there's no overall period, 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 periodic structure, okay? And, that, and we see this here. And so in, in the tri-layer case, the configuration is not, okay, here the configuration is just a two-dimensional disregistry, but in the tri-layer case, say if we're on layer two, right, we have a, we have a 2D uh, disregistry with respect to layer one and with respect to layer three, so we really have a four-dimensional disregistry uh, for a tri-layer. And of course, two times P minus one for P layers. Okay, so, uh, so this is, uh, so the tri-layer uh, turns out to be uh, much richer, much more computationally demanding than, than a bilayer system. Okay, so now, um, like I said, we're gonna, we wanna, uh, we need, because we have these large moray cells, we can't do DFT on the whole, on the whole uh, moray cell, right? We need to have a multi-scale method, and our and what we use what we use are uh, var, Varnier orbitals. Now uh, I think we're going to have a talk on uh, Shang. Shang will give us the talk, and uh, so so this is uh, really a complex uh, uh, and a challenging uh, problem to construct Varnier orbitals for uh, for these twisted heterostructures because okay for graphene as we know the famous uh, model from from 1947, like, wow, you just need one or two numbers, right? For a periodic problem, there's just you know, an on-site hopping, maybe a nearest neighbor, a next nearest neighbor. Two or three numbers is all you need to characterize the tight binding model. Very, very simple. Now, in an incommensurate problem, as we move from, as, for an incommensurate problem, as we go from atom to atom, it's almost like we have a new crystal. We have to characterize a new crystal for every configuration because the local, the atoms are in different positions. Okay, so very, very hard. Uh, and uh, and Chang has kind of done this for a whole library of 2D materials by now, right? I mean, so we'll we'll hear more about that. So uh, 
uh, okay, so that's, uh, okay, so, uh, okay, so in, in general, I think what, what Xiang does is he has some, he, he invokes symmetry and he has uh, some parameterization uh, which lets us do everything, everything else. Okay, so basically, as we all know, uh, we, have, we, we have our, uh, okay, for every lattice point and every orbital, right, we, we have a, a Varnay function and we only need to describe the, the Varnay function um, um, right at, at the origin, and then we just translate them around, okay? Well, this is really just, uh, okay, it's not quite so simple here in the, in the, in the multilayers. In a, in a crystal, all you do is you just translate it around. Now we have to uh, re-evaluate at every point, depending on where we are. But in any case, we, uh, and this, this is not totally a little simplified here, but basically, end of the day, you know, we, ha we have these uh, uh, Varnier functions at, at each uh, Varnier orbitals, and from that we construct a tight binding Hamiltonian, okay? So, so please, uh, when you refer to a continuum model previously, you said it's periodic, are you referring to this, or because the potential here is periodic? Okay, in a, let's say in a, peri in a periodic structure, right, this is periodic, right. but in an incommensurate, wait, Okay, and, okay, each layer is periodic, okay? But then the, the uh, uh, you know, it's, it's not gonna be truly periodic, you know, because of interlayer coupling, okay? So as I move from atom to atom, the other, the atoms on the other layer are gonna are influence the, uh, the, the, the hopping parameters, the local matrix elements. Okay, so it's not periodic, okay? In, in the incommensurate case. Okay. Okay. So that I mean, I mean that's that's. Uh, um, okay. If I. Uh, okay. This is a little confusing slide. I see. Okay. Um, okay. All right. Okay. So let's. Uh, um, okay, so let me, uh, okay, I want to talk first about uh, density of states. Uh, then if we have time, we'll talk about conductivity. It turns out that the conductivity problem, a Kubo formula, pretty much is identical to density of states from a, the point of view of like, like formulating the problem. Uh, it's much more complicated from the computational point of view because the conductivity function has poles, right? Because of the, uh, you, you'll, I mean, those, you, if, you, if you've looked at Kubo formula, you know, you have poles from the Fermi Dirac distribution. And so basically computing at low temperature, experimental temperatures is very hard. We've made some progress on that. I'll, okay, so but let's just focus on density of states for now. Um, okay, so, I mean, the first question is, is, is the density of states uh, well defined? Okay, and that wasn't obvious to us when we first started. Uh, so let's just, uh, um, okay, so let's, so we have our P layer system. This means you take the lattice and you truncate the lattice at some radius R to have a finite domain problem, okay? So we're not doing periodic, we're just doing a large body a limit, okay? So. Uh, so, this is, so this is now all those degrees of freedom within some distance r from some origin. Okay, and then we have, again, we have a, we have a finite domain Hamiltonian, and, and we can, uh, I mean, in theory, this has a well-defined density of states, uh, and the question is, as I let r go to infinity, does this thing converge? Okay, does it converge? Just the, and that's the object, of course, that we, that we want. So, uh, okay, so we characterize uh, the density of states as a linear function on what we call test functions. Uh, and this is how we compute density of states from the computational point of view. So, so, what, so for us, uh, the density of states is just we, we have some, uh, let's say, uh, continue, or normally you have some smooth function g. In fact, normally what we're using is, is a Gaussian centered at some uh, energy of interest, and so you apply. You, you need. You want to apply. You want to apply that nonlinear function. You, you, sorry, apply this this function right to the to the Hamiltonian, 
uh, and take its trace, right? And that's, okay, and just, uh, and, and this is exactly the object we want, right? We're just summing over eigenvalues with some kind of filter given by the, the Gaussian. And this gives, a, this is our smooth density of states. We're smoothing the density of states by a Gaussian. That, that's all we're, we're doing here. So this says, uh, what we need to do is we need to take, take the trace of a uh, function of, of a Hamiltonian, okay? And now we can characterize that linear functional by, in fact, a, a true density, okay? And, uh, and from the, you know, and, and the reason we like uh, to look at these Gaussians, eventually we're gonna have to approximate this by some, well, some of Chebyshev polynomials, and we end up, the only thing we ever really have to do computationally is just, is, is apply uh, the, the, uh, the Hamiltonian you know, to, to, a, to a vector, okay, to a, to a state. Okay, so, uh, okay, so what is the, um, um, okay, so then we have, uh, uh, you know, what we call local density of states. So the local density of states are just the diagonal elements, right? And these, and these are, uh, and this is a, you know, experimentally accessible uh, property, local density of states. So this is just, you know, if you probe the density at, um, at lattice point R, right, at, on one of the layers, uh, and you could probe even a particular orbital, okay, and then if you, and then of course summing up the local density of states gives us the, the, the overall uh, density of states. But everything here is for this truncated uh, do finite domain, okay? So, um, okay, so then we have a, uh, so pretty much everything we do is, is coming from this, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's coming from saying, okay, so basically it, it's the, exactly this ergodic property as we move, uh, again, as, as we go from atom to atom, the, this kind of local environment is continuously varying. Uh, we're just sampling, you know, the unit cell. So that just says, okay, if we have a, uh, uh, if you have some, okay, so let's, okay, so the, the, uh, the local environment, say, on, on layer J is the product of the, of the unit cells of all the other layers. Okay, so again, if, if it was tri-layer, this would be a four-dimensional object, bilayer is just the, uh, the unit cell of the other, uh, the other layer. And if we have a, uh, a periodic function, right, if we have a periodic function on that, uh, on this uh, two times P minus one dimensional torus, right, and we just, and if we just sample over H over lattice J, we, we are simply, we're just, we're, we just have to average you know, it's just an ergodic property. We just have to average H over the set of configurations, okay? So, uh, okay, so just, uh, if, we, if we went from, if we just went and, and, uh, and, and we evaluated, you know, H at every red site, okay, uh, it's the same as just averaging, uh, it's the same as staying at, staying at one red site and just, Kind of uh, sh shifting the the layer layer two the blue layer around. Okay, so that's all that that that's all that is. So uh, okay, so this uh, and so this is really. Uh, I mean, we invoke this where H could be things like could be local density of states, local conductivity. It could be a site energy. Uh, so this this lets us uh, study pretty much all the different uh, properties uh, you know that, that we're interested in. Okay, we've seen that before. Okay, so let's uh, let, let's see how it plays out in um, in a uh, in 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 the local density of states. So as I said, uh, you know, if I wanted to, okay, so what's one way to compute the uh, the density of states? So one way to to compute it would be, okay, I'm going to go here, and I'm just going to go to I'm going to sample, let's say, the red the red sites, and for each red sites I sample, I, maybe I take a little ball of radius R, I go and I, then I now uh, compute its, uh, the local density of states from that little sample. Okay, I could do that, uh, but another way to do that is rather than go to, to every, to all these sample of red sites, I literally can just stay 
at one, I can have a fixed red site, and I could just move layer, uh, la the, the layer two around. Okay, so that's, and, and that's just because the local density of the Hamiltonian, let's say at some atom R, okay, if, I'm at, if I'm at site R, and I want to know the local density there, that's the same as, say, some, some fixed, uh, let's call it zero, the zero uh, lattice point. It's the same as, as just as, as the local configuration, the, the disregistry at that point. It's the same thing. You just, uh, you just say, okay, if, I, if, I, if, I'm at, if I'm at a site R, then I look and those layers are, each layer has a particular disregistry with, these, with respect to me, and is all I really, that's the only thing that's really important from the point of view of the local density. And so what I could just do is just sit at some fixed site and then just uh, c continuously, uh, and then just kind of move the layers rather than walk around. Okay, it's just a, that's, uh, so what does that lead us to? Uh, okay, so if I, if I use this property, then, and I want to compute the, um, uh, the density of states, this was the object, right, I wanted to compute, I wanted to, to uh, uh, I wanted to sum over, uh, um, I wanted to sum over every site, and, and typically, you know, this R, the R could, is going to be much bigger, it's going to include many more A cells, because it's not periodic, so, uh, okay, so basically this is, I'm going to sum over all those sites, and that says, it's the same, it's, it's, uh, it turns out to be equivalent to, to essentially uh, looking at the local density at say some fixed position and then, and then do all those, the appropriate shifts, okay? Do all the appropriate shifts, which is, the, which is then, which is then we can go to the limit and it says, okay, this is an exact uh, statement of the, of the density of states. It says for each layer, uh, each orbital on that layer, we, we take the local density of states, uh, you know, say of layer J, and I just, I just continuously deform the disregistry of all the other states. Okay, so now once I, I have this, this written this way, okay, then, uh, right, then I can go and, uh, you know, I can go and create, do some quadrature, or sampling on, on X sub J, I get, I ch get to choose R, uh, then I have to have a, a, a polynomial, a, a solution method, that's, the, we use this Chebyshev polynomial to, a method to, or kernel, pro, kernel polynomial method to, to essentially approximate the delta function to evaluate the density of, of states at a particular energy. Okay, now, now one thing that is, uh, uh, is, is, is very important, and you know, it's that the, okay, let's, is that there's actually a, <clears throat> you know, you might naively think, okay, naively, right, I could just take this some gigantic ball and then uh, diagonalize it, right, and c try to compute a local density, and if I did that, that gives, that only gives linear convergence, okay, because the local density at, at the boundary is, the, the, is going to be very bad, okay, so we have, all the boundary stuff is not good, okay. But our, our method is simply, it, we just go, we, we just sample these points and we take, we take a, little, a little neighborhood around that point and, and the neighborhood can be re relatively small because we're gonna have some exponential decay of the local density as, our, as that sample ball gets larger and larger. Okay, so, so bottom line is uh, we, you know, we can prove this kind of result that essentially uh, the, okay, as R goes to infinity, right, we have exponential decay. Okay. All right, now, uh, okay, so we have this bound. Okay, so then algorithmically, what do we have to do? We have to sample from the torus. Uh, we have to, um, uh, kind of create these finite Hamiltonians for the shifted, for the shift, these cut, we have to have finite shifted Hamiltonians. We have to determine R. Uh, then we have to approximate the, uh, the delta function. Um, okay, so there's, 
all the, there's various different parameters uh, in the numerical approximation. What we've done is we've essentially, I mean, we're, we're, we're mathematicians. We actually explicitly, we get balanced for the error with all the parameters, and then we create an efficient method by optimizing you know, the choice of uh, sampling, radius, uh, and numerical method. And in the end, we have a, we have a, you know, a, a relatively efficient method. Okay, so this is, maybe I'm not gonna go to the, okay, so you can actually prove this by using what's called this uh, uh, Coombe-Toms decay estimate. It's just, it's just falling from the Cauchy integral formula and, uh, and the fact that if a Hamiltonian, if the entries decay exponentially for the Hamiltonian, then the, the ex, uh, then the resolvent has a similar property. Okay, that's, that's what, that's how that R goes to infinity estimates all fall from that. Okay, let me not do this. Okay, and this is, you know, kind of things that we, well, this is old, as Stephen will remind me, I think, but I don't know, I haven't had time to change my slides here, but okay, this just shows early thing we did with this, uh, and this is just, uh, uh, you know, density of states uh, with respect to twist angle, you know, and again, the challenging part is getting close to zero uh, twist angle because that's when the Moray cell gets, goes, the size of the Moray cell goes like one over theta. And, uh, and this just shows, this is just local density of states. Anyway, so we have a very efficient method. We can, we can quickly access all these properties. Okay, so now, uh, Okay, so let me okay, talk about uh, momentum space methods. Okay, so, um, so again, I have to confess, you know, being, you know, we're kind of mathematicians. We kind of uh, entered into this not knowing all the things physicists have been doing. <laughs> so, uh, so this is, uh, you know, related to, what well, it's related to certainly the work of uh, McDonald. That's, uh, uh, I guess, probably the 2007 paper also uses momentum space methods. What? No, we started late. I know. Plus I have time. I took that into account. Three minutes. Okay, well, okay, they, but uh, actually I was told by Christian we want to fill up some time. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's the time. Okay, okay, no, I'm, I'm gonna finish this part, okay. So, uh, uh, okay, so basically this is a, I wanna present this formalism. You know, it's, uh, I've had some long standing back and forth with Stephen. I think Stephen's, I now think, yeah, you can do this within what's called se second quantization. So physicists like the second quantization formalism, it seems, most of them do. And that's how pretty much most things are written. This is a, a little, uh, is somewhat, is basically a, I mean, at least at some points it's one to one mapping. Okay, so I'm just gonna, let's show you a little bit how the formalism works. Uh, I think when Zoe will use the second quantization formalism, and Zoe will also carry this whole thing to a uh, rather sophisticated uh, uh, and real computation by doing some low energy approximations and some things like that. So I'm not gonna do that, That's, uh, I leave that for, for Zoe. But let me just uh, say a few words about this. Okay, so we have a, here's our P, la P layer uh, wave function, we can write it C1 through Cp, right? We have a wave function associated with each layer. Uh, now we have our, our degrees of freedom. And, and okay, we can do the block transform on, 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 every, on every sheet, okay? So this, this means the Brion zone of layer J. So the point is here, I'm not, I'm not clearly stating this, but w this, uh, uh, this operation is, is a block transform, but the block transform is really different on each sheet because we have a different lattice, okay? So, so if, if I apply the block transform to my Hamiltonian, right, the big deal about the block transform for a translation variant uh, operator is you diagonalize it. Well, at least, or in our case, you kind of make it block diagonal because of these orbitals. So that's all that is. And if, if there was no interlayer interaction, we'd be done. Each le we'd be, we essentially have diagonalized the whole problem, okay? But there is interlayer interaction, and so if you apply the, if you just go and you apply the block transform to the interlayer interaction terms, uh, you get a rather, a beautiful uh, r formula that gives uh, scattering to the reciprocal lattice, 
Okay, and this falls from the, the Poisson summation for, uh, formula. Okay, so, so we have a, uh, so then, so like I said, we, we transform, we just directly do this momentum space transformation, and then we see that the, uh, the jth, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the K, the, sorry, the Q, <clears throat> uh, wave for the jth layer scatters to the uh, the the kth layer to the wave to the waves q plus gj, where gj is in the reciprocal lattice of layer j, since uh, cj is actually uh, translation variant to the the kth res, uh, reciprocal lattice. We can then sub subtract out a gk. Uh, so and then okay so. Now it turns out uh, the bilayer case is, is simple. The, the trilayer and multilayer case gets is, mu is much more complicated. And again, I think Zoe, you'll be explaining that I think in your lecture, right? That's really so. That really makes trilayer much more difficult. Um, okay, one thing that we've that we've explored is we actually like to so somehow you've got a sample. Uh, uh, so okay, so in the end we we, we have to. So we're going to have to somehow discretize these Brion zones. Well, there's a, there's a very simple way to do that and to put it into the framework of our real space method. So the framework just essentially observes that, what the hell's going on here? Uh, where are we going? Oh, yeah. Here. Okay, so the framework is, is that, you know, here's, our, here's a wave, right? Here's a wave on layer one uh, given by wave number Q, and we can also describe it because of the incommensurability by a um, reciprocal lattice vector of layer two. Okay, so we can describe every layer on, on uh, layer one by a reciprocal lattice of layer two. So, okay, so what that means is that we can actually define uh, the reciprocal lattice, the reciprocal lattice vectors of, uh, on, for layer J, is given by the, or rather, the degrees of freedom on layer ch J are the reciprocal lattice vectors of layer of, of the other layer times the orbitals. Okay, so this, bef this, or this, this is the same thing as the Brion zone of layer J. So instead of the Brion zone of layer J, we we'll use the reciprocal lattice of the other layer. Okay, and again, so once we do that, then literally, we we have a Hamiltonian we, in, in terms of a. Uh, of this reciprocal lattice, of this lattice, reciprocal lattice, and we're, t we're completely in the, in, the, uh, in the setting of the real space method. There's, there's no difference. We've just done a, in an isometry to, a, uh, to the reciprocal lattice. We can apply all, the, all those methods that we had for real space, okay? And, uh, okay, and then we, again, the traces are the same. Everything's the same. Uh, um, okay, then we can, and we can also do this for multi-layer. Right now, multi-layer is a little more difficult, of course, because we know now the the uh, the configuration space is two times p minus one. Right. So now the uh, right we 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 we, we characterize the uh, the the uh, reciprocal degrees of freedom for layer J in terms of reciprocal lattice vectors of all the other layers. Okay, so in trilayer we have a four-dimensional uh, uh, space. Okay, and again we can we can formulate uh, th this uh, this now as a as a more complex uh, kind of Hamiltonian. Okay, so that's so this whole this whole formalism uh, right generalizes to the multilayer case. Now uh, we've developed this uh, th 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 this approach. Where okay the the power of the k dot p method is it directly tells you right well you just really have to sample so the, the real space the prob, the thing is generally the local uh, density is a fairly smooth function but in momentum space the local density say in non interacting cases the 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 local density is, 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 is a delta function. It's very concentrated. We don't have to sample over the whole domain like we did in, in, real, in real space. This is just, and these are some uh, computations Stephen did, did for me. Okay, so let's just look at, uh, okay, so here, uh, this is just, uh, 
uh, okay, so here if we have decoupled four degree twisted bilayer graphene. This is the, this is the uh, local density of spit states in momentum space. And then when we uh, apply the coupling, then what we see is, you know, most of the region has no, de at that energy, there's no density, okay? So we really only need to sample over a small region. Uh, so we call, so we've, we've worked all that out. Uh, we, instead, we approximate the, uh, uh, the operator, uh, not by the, the full kind of degree of freedom space, but we introduce a degree of freedom space that only worries about the <coughs> degrees of freedom with some density. And if, uh, then we, we end up with some very much improved like estimates uh, that actually, that uh, in fact, and in fact actually uh, can be realized. So this is, uh, again, this is something, uh, so I think it's a little, okay, it has the possibility of being more general than, than the K dot P approach. Okay, I mean, by that I mean, okay, so the pre-approximation, they're the same. Then you go into the numerical with the way things are implemented. And, and this, I think, is, you know, can be more, more general. Um, but okay. Then, uh, okay, so now the multi-layer case is a little more complicated, right, because uh, uh, now we uh, say in, in tri-layer, uh, we have a little more complicated regions to, uh, to worry about. Okay, let me, uh, okay, so now how much time do I have, Dio? Well, we have entered the question time now, so if you want to satisfy the question, we have like five minutes. Okay, well, that, that's how we normally do it here. Okay, <laughs> that's how we've been doing it, right? Okay, but okay, then, uh, okay, so, okay, so I, let me, I'm not gonna do all this stuff, but basically, uh, okay, for, okay, there's this amazing, uh, and I, I was amazed, okay, you have like a Kubo formula for conductivity, it's in the textbooks uh, for, for periodic problems. In fact, uh, this was kind of like in our proposal. We said, okay, we're gonna do this, then we got together, and I, maybe Steven and Shang remember were on the board, and Tim was writing formulas, didn't quite make sense. Uh, and so this was kind of the original uh, challenge. Uh, so, um, okay, so this is sort of what's in, if you go look in uh, Tim Kixeris' book on elect electronic structure, uh, you get some kind of, you actually get some kind of formula like this. Oh, damn, what was going on here? Uh, you get some kind of formula. Uh, okay, you get some kind of form. Okay, okay, so you get some kind of formula like this. Okay, so again, I'm applying this to the uh, to a, now a periodic problem. Uh, and what am I doing here? Okay, so the main thing is you have these. Uh, I guess they're called derivations, or they're, they're actually just current operators. Okay, and this is our Louis Villian operator, Fermi Dirac distribution, uh, et cetera. Okay, so that's the formalism, the, the formula there is equivalent to this guy. I think this is more recognized by physicists, at least by, I've, okay, so basically, so this part here is called the, the uh, current current uh, correlation measure. Uh, this part is called the conductivity function. So eventually, okay, so this is all in the periodic context and Okay, and then we, we let R go to infinity and you get this kind of very nice formula that again is generally in the textbooks, okay? So how do we generalize to incommensurate? Well, uh, you know, we, we, can, we can do it all. We, we, can, uh, we can define a velocity operator and then we can define a matrix value current current correlation measure on these finite systems. Uh, okay, so we can, okay, so we actually have this approximation the, you know, the big challenge here is, in fact, um, okay, so we can do this local method of sampling. Uh, the big challenge is dealing with this, uh, what I call the uh, conductivity function, and that's because this, this guy has poles. Let me go s skip through that. Uh, oh, by the way, so this just shows how our method is exponentially convergent with respect, uh, as opposed to the, let's say, the direct, the, uh, the method of saying, okay, I'm just gonna take larger and larger kind of domains, our little local sampling method and averaging. Um, okay, then, um, then, okay, so let's see. Okay, so basically, okay, so we have to deal with this uh, um, conductivity function. So the most obvious thing is to expand in Chebyshev polynomials, just like we did in, for density. 
Uh, now the problem is, is, is we have these poles, as I mentioned. Uh, let me go through, let me just mention that. Okay, so here, here's, our, here's our function. It has, uh, that's a product. The, each of these functions has a pole. Here you have to deal with the Fermi-Dirac problem, which has poles of uh, K over beta, K temperature. Temperature gets small, the poles uh, converge to zero. Very bad for Chebyshev, uh, for Chebyshev approximation. Um, okay, so then we've uh, kind of done a, a pretty systematic study of, of the convergence rates uh, and the, the and, you know, when, uh, so we have problems both with low temperature and low, and low relaxation. And uh, so the, the main thing is, is that you don't have to do this full Chebyshev polynomial in each, in each, uh, in, in, okay, remember you have a, uh, uh, you have two energies involved, right? It's a, uh, rather than one energy as in density. And then, so we have to do a double Chebyshev. And it turns out that most of the Chebyshev terms are actually zero in, let's say, in the, in the nice case of, of nice temperature and nice relaxation. In the cases that unfortunately re relate to experimental conditions, uh, these poles start to bite us. And now we can just, we can do some pole removal. So, okay, so we've done, we've done some exploration of this, of, of how to compute uh, the, um, uh, you know, Kubo formula uh, and trying to probe, uh, you know, experimental conditions. And then we also, then I don't have that, I haven't even put it in my slide. We have uh, some results on applying uh, momentum space methods, which of course are even better. So with that in mind, I, I think I'll just, yeah, we got to, these are just a small sample of papers. We have math papers, uh, which uh, mathematicians might like to read, physicists. Uh, if, you're, uh, if you're kind of, you know, a lot of physicists are really uh, ex-mathematicians. For those guys, or partial mathematicians, for those guys, you know, like Stephen, it's no problem. Uh, but uh, but then, they, then, then we have our kind of uh, physics-oriented physics, physics -oriented papers that I, uh, that I think are, re are, uh, are uh, readable to physicists, I hope, since we have, you know, since, uh, okay, and so I guess what, maybe one thing that has uh, been kind of uh, fun is, you know, we wrote this paper in 2017, and I, I don't know, was it Tim or somebody came up with this word, twistronics? So yeah, so now all these New York Times articles say we're in the er era of twistronics. And so, uh, you know, and, and in Wikipedia, we, if you type in Twistronics, the first sentence says Twistronics is this, and it gives re a reference to our paper. So, uh, so in wh whatever we've done in this field, uh, we may have coined it, okay? Now, that, okay, that's like, okay, that can be the biggest thing, right? <laughs> to coin this, to, to give, a, to coin the subject, you know? So, yeah, we're yeah, literally, you know, we should get a patent now on this word, twistronics. Okay, very good. Thank you all.